So, hello everyone. I'm Oryx Sidney, the President of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. And uh, today we have a fantastic presentation by uh, Mr. Ibrahim Chalo, who's a consultant neurosurgeon from Cambridge. We're going to uh, take more time after we present the different um, attendees to present Mr. Chalo. So, first, um, Chidebere, can you please present yourself? Hello. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. As I'm Chide Berry Bay, and um, I'm a member of the um, Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. I'm a medical illustrator, and, um, and I'm a Nigerian. Nice to have you, Chide Berry. Um, thanks. So, next up, um, Chimuka Kuma. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chimuka Mulea. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Zambia. I'm also a member of AFAN. Thank you. Thanks, Chimuka. Um, David Urish Dale. Hello, everyone. I am David Urish Dale. I'm a student, first year student, medical student in Russia. And uh, I'm equally member of AFAN and a member of the communication and operation team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Next up, uh, Daniel Safari. Please unmute and present yourself. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ilrui. I'm Daniel Safari in Teranya. I'm a medical doctor from DRC, presently in Bukavu, and uh, I'm a member of AFAN and uh, the actual uh, coordinator of incision DRC. Great. Thanks. Um, Saktai. Yes, hello. hello. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sakta Idiami, a medical doctor from Tanzania. Yeah, I'm happy to be here today. I'm eager to hear from Mr. Jello. Thank you very much. Um, next on the list is oh, Dr. Gangpe Fortune. Hello, everybody. My name is. Fortune Gangpe. I'm, I recent, I'm from Benin, but I live now in Morocco. I recently finished my resi neurosurgery residency program. So uh, since a few days, uh, maybe two weeks, <laughs> I am a consultant neurosurgeon. Congratulations and thanks for being here as always. Um, Thank you. Gideon Adekboyega. Um, hi all. My name is Gideon Adekboyega and I am Currently, medical student at Barton in the London. Yeah, pleasure to be here as always. As always, thank you, Gideon. Um, Dr. Uk Dokpuno. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Uk Dokpuno. I'm uh, from Benin Republic. Uh, currently, I'm a uh, um, neurosurgical uh, resident at the WFNS Center, training center in, in Rabat and Morocco. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uk. Uh, Joshua Arabo. Hi, good evening. I'm Joshua Arabo. I'm a third year medical student at Exeter University. Nice to have you. Uh, Dr. Leon Yanu. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Leo Yanu. I'm a medical doctor from Cameroon. I'm great to be there. Thank you. Thanks. Lorenzo Gopelo. Hello everyone, my name is Lorraine Sabapella, a second year medical student from the University of Botswana. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Um, Samuel Chilawa. Hello everyone, my name is Samuel Chilawa. I'm a fourth year medical student from Zambia. I'm a member of Alpha. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thanks. And finally, um, Shivani Rashkumar. Hi, I'm Shivani Rajkumar, a junior doctor at Cambridge, and I'm li really looking forward to IB or Mr. Jalo's talk. Well, thank you so much, Shivani, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, okay, so without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for the day. Um, so today we have the pleasure of um, hosting uh, Mr. Ibrahim Jalo, who's a consultant 
in um, adult and pediatric neurosurgery um, from Cambridge, United Kingdom. Um, he was awarded the World Federation of Neurosurgical Society's um, Young Neurosurgeon of the Year Award in 2017. Um, his research aims to explore several aspects of energy metabolism in the normal and injured human brain. Uh, Mr. Jalo gained his uh, master's, uh, MA and MBBS from the University of Oxford and the University, of, um, University College London. And he was awarded a PhD from the University of Cambridge. His neurosurgery training was uh, in Nottingham and Cambridge, and his specialty areas of uh, interest are uh, brain tumor surgery, spinal surgery in both adults and children. Uh, he received specialist training in Toronto, Canada, and in Liverpool in the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Jallo, we are happy to have you today. Uh, please unmute your mic and share your screen. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Ulrich. It's a real honor, a real pleasure to be able to participate today. Um, and it's really nice that I got to hear the members of a AFAN introduce themselves. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to share my screen just so I can show my slides. Um, if at any point there are questions that come up, please feel free to use the chat column. Um, I'll try and respond to them as we go through. If not, um, I can always review them at the end. Um, so I just want to make sure, can everybody um, see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I suppose today I was just going to talk about some aspects of my research um, and training. Um, Um, and just really to introduce myself um, and to explain um, how I got here, basically, how I got to being a consultant neurosurgeon in Cambridge. Um, so as you've heard from Ulrich already, my research interests are um, head injuries, so traumatic brain injury, um, and specifically neurochemistry of traumatic brain injury. Um, and the talk today really is just about three lessons that I've learned um, from my time training in neurosurgery and doing neuroscience research. So my parents came to the UK from Sierra Leone in the early 70s. Um, they initially settled in Bristol in the west of, uh, in the west of England um, and then moved to London where I was born and spent my early years um, before my parents moved to the suburban rurality of an English village, um, which was not my choice, but that's predominantly where I grew up. My parents were extremely supportive and I think like most second generation kids in the UK whose parents have less of a foothold in the country, um, they encouraged me into a safe and stable career path um, and so um, I ended up doing medicine. Um, I enjoyed school um, and I did well enough to get into med school uh, in Oxford which is really where I developed a, a keen interest in neuroscience in the brain. Um, so this is my entry photograph for the students in Oxford. And you may have spotted me already, but there I am. Um, so my college in Oxford was Somerville College, um, which you can see on the left. Um, and as you can see, all in, uh, Oxford um, you know, can appear particularly grandiose um, and imposing. Um, but I, I don't think that was anything that um, phased me in particular. Actually, during my time at Oxford, um, there was a lot of attention on the physiology and neuroscience departments in the hospital, um, in particular on one of my neuroscience professors called um, Colin Blakemore, um, who was a professor of neuroscience in Oxford, um, and actually one of the most famous scientists in the UK at the time, and partly because he was a very vocal um, pop scientist, um, so he communicated a lot, wrote a lot of articles. Um, but also he'd become the hate figure um, for the animal rights movement um, in the UK. And Oxford, during my time there, and particularly the neuroscience and physiology departments, were targeted by the animal rights movement. And so that meant when I was going to lectures and laboratory um, sessions sometimes, um, we had to be um, escorted by the police, um, which was, I thought at the time, truly exciting. Um, there was even a bomb threat at one point. Um, and I think as a naive student, 
I think all of this excitement, danger, this ideological antagonism and piqued my interest in research and science and in the neurosciences. Um, so after med school, um, I did various uh, uh, house jobs in and around London. And then I ended up doing my neurosurgery residency, my training in Cambridge um, and Nottingham. Um, I was lucky, really lucky in the sense um, that there was a wealth of research infrastructure available around me, particularly in Cambridge um, within the clinical neurosciences. Um, and I was also lucky that I had mentors that were supported, not just in an emotional sense, um, but very much in a practical sense um, in terms of helping me get, get funding um, to do a PhD and to do some research during my training. Um, getting funding, as I'm sure you're aware, is usually the rate limiting step for any research project. Um, just in preparation for my talk today, I took a quick snapshot um, of my Dropbox folder um, that has a list of all the grants that I applied to. And I really started applying for research grants um, back in 2008, 2009, um, and received lots and lots of rejections um, before managing to secure some money um, to do some research. And um, so I suppose the first kind of take home message, the first lesson um, that I've learned from my training and from research is that you really have to um, persevere. Um, you can't be phased by the um, grandiose and imposing um, buildings and people that surround you. Um, and it pays to be persistent, particularly when trying to um, derive research funding. Um, so on to a bit of the science um, that I've had the opportunity to do. Um, I was exposed to various aspects of neuroscience during my training, uh, but I was most intrigued by some aspects of neurochemistry um, because of the tight integration between clinical practice and basic science. And hopefully this will become more apparent um, in my talk. Um, because of this integration between the basic science and clinical practice, it means that you can maintain um, the detail and, I suppose, elemental aspects of basic science research without it becoming too esoteric and losing touch with the bigger picture. Um, so that was the appeal of the research that I chose to do. So the brain is an expensive organ that depends on glucose. Um, so, for example, in a normal, conscious, young adult man, the brain only compromises 2% of total body weight, total body mass, um, but consumes 25% of the um, glucose um, and consumes about 20% of the total resting body oxygen consumption. Um, so the brain is a hugely expensive um, organ in terms of um, energy metabolites. Um, and that's understandable because it needs that energy for those endless, unceasing sparks of synaptic transmission that maintain normal ion gradients and allow neurotransmitter recycling. Um, at times of um, extreme, so you know, in some um, in some areas of development, but also during starvation, the brain can use other fuels, um, such as ketone bodies, um, but they really depend on a constant supply um, of glucose. Um, as a side note, uh, I didn't really care too much for biochemistry as an undergraduate, um, and this is my report card for my first year as an Oxford student um, from my biochemistry tutor at, at the time, Dr. Callaghan. Um, so he writes, um, Ibrahim is a pleasant student, but one who needs to put more work into his preparation for tutorials. It is difficult to distinguish which areas he has problems in from those in which he is not prepared for. At times, he is a reluctant participant in tutorial discussions and with more prior preparation could demonstrate fully his biochemical knowledge. His written work is substantial, but suffers a common problem in that much is regurgitation of textbook, lecture, handout material and not focus on the actual question. So during my first um, semester, my first term in Oxford, I think I had eight tutorials with Dr. Callaghan. Um, and if you're not familiar with the tutorial system in Oxford, and that meant it was usually just me and another student with Dr. Callahan, or a couple of students and me. And we would sit for an hour each week for which we would have to write an essay. Um, and to be honest, I think I really didn't care about biochemistry at the time. I think I was more interested in other things that were going on um, in my life, perhaps socially. Um, and also, I think looking back at this, I, I don't think I can really recall Dr. Callahan uh, whatsoever, which I suppose is telling um, of my 
engagement or I suppose lack of engagement with biochemistry at the time. Um, anyway, I persisted um, and thankfully to my parents, uh, I graduated, um, which obviously they were super proud about. Uh, so I find it kind of funny, ironic, I suppose, that um, despite my antipathy to biochemistry as a student, I based my academic career um, on this. I based my academic career on something that I didn't really care for as an undergraduate. The dreaded TCA or Krebs cycle, which I'm sure you can all remember from um, medical school days. Um, and I, I suppose at the time, I was maybe just too young to appreciate how something so dry and tedious as glycolysis, um, which is the metabolism of glucose to pyrate, pyruvate within the cytoplasm, something as dry and tedious as the TCA cycle, um, you know, actually, um, when you think about it, um, is deeply coupled um, to the heart of neurotransmission. And really, it's, you know, you can consider it um, an exquisite feat of biochemical engineering. Um, so just to run through quickly, I'm sure you know glucose is metabolized to pyruvate in the cytoplasm, so that's glycolysis. Pyruvate enters the mitochondria, enters the TCA cycle. Um, the TCA cycle generates in the um, electrons on the electron transport chain that generates the gradient that allows, that permits the production of ATP. Um, one of the spin-offs of the TCA cycle is glutamate. And so that's how the um, energy biochemistry apparatus is um, intimately integrated um, with neurotransmission. So at the heart of neurotransmission is metabolic trafficking between neurons and astrocytes. Um, but we don't yet fully understand that. Um, probably one of the most polished hypotheses on the metabolic traffic trafficking between neurons and astrocytes um, is something called the astrocyte neuron lactate shuttle um, hypothesis, which was derived on the basis of experimental and animal data in the 90s. Um, and this describes how glucose is taken up from the vasculature um, into astrocytes. Um, the glucose is metabolized by glycolysis to lactate. The astrocytes then feed that lactate to the neurons. So neurons preferentially metabolize lactate as an energy substrate. Um, Glutamate, as I said, is a spin-off of the TCA cycle. So glutamate is released from the presynaptic neuron. That glutamate is hoovered up by the astrocytes, converted to glutamine, um, or re-enters the TCA cycle in the astrocyte, and then that's fed, by, fed back um, to the neurons. Um, so there's important metabolic trafficking that exists between the astrocytes um, and the neurons. Um, and it's something that we don't fully understand um, just yet. Um, and it's a way of, you know, of showing how energy metabolism and the TCA cycle are intimately related and at the core of neurotransmission. So the TCA cycle, energy metabolism, it's, you know, it's both the drive shaft, it's the engine, and it's the ECU of a modern car um, all at one. Um, so what at first impression to me, i.e. biochemistry, um, appeared tedious, a bit boring um, as an undergrad, has really become my academic um, passion. So I suppose my second kind of learning from my research and training was to be wary of first impressions. There's lots of surprises um, in sciences. Um, and so, yeah, and so I've been, you know, um, later intrigued by neurochemistry, as, whereas something, it was something I found pretty tedious to begin with. So I'm a neurosurgeon, um, and so as a neurosurgeon, I see lots of patients with head injuries, both children and adults. Um, there will always be patients with head injuries. Um, I suppose one of the good things about head injuries, TBI patients, is that they provide a convenient way in which to interrogate human neurochemistry um, in vivo. And so patients with a severe brain injury um, require ventilation, sedation, and we insert a pressure monitor, an ICP monitor, um, to monitor brain swelling. Um, and then we can then target our interventions to minimize brain swelling, such as um, keeping the head of the bed up, um, using uh, sedative drugs, using uh, muscle paralysis, using osmotic agents um, to reduce swelling. And we titrate these, um, these interventions to our ICP monitors. Um, in addition to using pressure monitors, pressure sensors, um, we can also measure brain tissue oxygen levels um, and we can also insert 
mycodialysis catheters. Um, for those that don't know, a mycodialysis catheter um, essentially allows us to sample the extracellular fluid in the brain. So the catheter consists of a tip um, that is made up of a semi-permeable membrane that sits within the brain substance. Fluid is then pumped slowly through the catheter. The fluid equilibrates with the extracellular fluid across that semi-permeable membrane. Um, and then you can take the returning fluid from the catheter and use that to measure the concentration um, of small molecules that diff diffuse across that semi-permeable membrane. So using microdialysis, we can measure the concentration um, of glucose in extracellular fluid. Um, and so we can use that to make sure the brain is receiving um, enough glucose. Um, and we can also measure the lactate pyruvate ratio, um, which is a measure of the redox status. Um, so a measure of the degree to which the brain is undergoing anaerobic glycolytic metabolism uh, versus aerobic mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Um, so it gives us an indication as to, um, you know, how good oxidative metabolism is functioning in the brain um, by measuring the lactate pyruvate ratios. Um, one of the ways that we've adapted mycodialysis in Cambridge um, is to use it to deliver labelled substrates um, to the brain tissue. Um, so we can label energy substrates such as glucose microdose a region of the brain with these labeled substrates and then see how they're metabolized. So we use carbon-13 labeling. Um, carbon-13 is a stable isotope of carbon. So unlike normal carbon, carbon-12, carbon-13 has magnetic properties. So that means that any molecule that contains carbon-13 produces a particular um, signature um, a spectrum on nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, so the image in the middle is, the, is a photograph of one of the nuclear magnetic resonance um, spectrometry uh, machines that's in the Department of Chemistry in Cambridge. Um, so we take the fluid samples, the extracellular fluid samples from the patient, we analyse it with the NMR machine, um, and you produce a spectrum which you can see below. Um, and from the telltale um, spectra, um, you can identify the different metabolites that are in the extracellular fluid. Um, the neat thing about carbon-13 labelling is that not only can you identify which um, particular molecule is in the fluid, um, but you can also identify which particular carbon of the molecule has been labelled with the carbon-13. Um, so the image on the right of the screen is a schematic, a schematic um, of the things that we can evaluate with that. So for example, if you feed the brain um, lactate with carbon-13 on the third carbon of lactate, so 313C lactate, um, that is then taken up by the cells, um, metabolized the pyruvate, and then if it's metabolized via pyruvate di dehydrogenase to acetyl-CoA, which then enters the TCA cycle, and then if that then leaves the TCA cycle on the first turn to produce glutamine, um, the carbon-13 ends up on the fourth carbon of glutamine. Um, and essentially, the carbon-13 will label a different molecule of the carbon based on how it's got there. So not only can we use NMR to identify different metabolites in the brain fluid, um, but it also tells us the pathway um, that those metabolites have been produced by. Uh, and so that's a really powerful technique um, with which to interrogate metabolism in the brain. So one of the things that um, we showed with this is that we confirmed for the first time really in human brain in vivo um, that the brain has the biochemical capacity um, to metabolize lactate. Um, and really that's a paradigm shift in the way that we think about energy metabolism in the brain. Lactate was always considered a waste byproduct of metabolism. Um, but actually, the more that we understand, um, we, you know, we think that neurons probably um, metabolize lactate preferentially over glucose as an energy substrate. Um, and so this study shows that when we feed lactate, um, we produce glutamine, um, which is evidence that the lactate has been taken up by the cells and metabolized. Um, so back to the glycolysis and TCA cycle. Um, so again, the neat thing about using this carbon-13 labeling technique is that we can label different substrates to interrogate different aspects of metabolism. 
Um, so one of the other studies um, that I did was to try and evaluate how much of glucose is, is, um, goes down the normal route of glycolysis and how much glucose goes down the normal route or the other routes of the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, the pentose phosphate pathway is a parallel pathway to glycolysis, um, but it's a non-energy producing pathway. Um, it's involved in the synthesis of nucleic acids, so for DNA and fatty acids, so for tissue repair, and also in combating, um, combating um, oxidative stress. Um, so the pentose phosphate pathway is thought to be probably quite important at times of um, stress for the brain um, as a repair, as an oxidative stress mechanism. Um, and so by using um, glucose, which is a six carbon molecule, but with carbon 13 um, on the first two carbons, um, and then looking at the differential labeling um, of lactate, you can calculate um, the proportion of glucose that's metabolized by glycolysis and the proportion that's metabolized by the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, and again, that's a really powerful tool for examining and interrogating these pathways in the brain. Um, another thing that we've used um, this carbon-13 labeling for is to see if we can deliver substrates directly to the mitochondrial TCA cycle. Um, so succinate, if you remember, is one of the molecules of the TCA cycle, one of the intermediates of the TCA cycle. Uh, but it's an interesting um, molecule because it also forms a direct point of contact um, between the uh, TCA cycle and the mitochondrial electron transport chains. It's um, one of the complexes in the um, inner membrane of the mitochondria. So if you can give succinate directly into the mitochondria, it's a way of bypassing the TCA cycle to drive electron transport chains and to produce um, ATP um, without the need for all the um, previous steps. Um, so again, this is just to demonstrate uh, we did this study where we gave labelled um, succinate and demonstrated that the, we can feed the mitochondria directly with this energy substrate and use the carbon-13 labelling to, um, if you like, work out how this succinate um, was metabolised. So that's really just an introduction to the neurochemistry research uh, that I've been doing. Um, and really... Um, these studies that I've described um, are trying to understand the fundamental metabolic processes and pathways um, of metabolism between neurons and astrocytes. Um, and the reason that we study them in TBI patients is in part related to the convenience of being able to place microdialysis catheters into the brains of TBI patients. Um, so I suppose the kind of my third lesson from my um, academic career is um, it pays to adapt to what's available to you. Um, so in a way, my research has been very much guided by the ability to sample using microdialysis catheters in TBI patients that are readily available um, to me. Um, so again, that's, it's, it's about adapting to um, what's available to you and to answer scientific questions um, that you have. Um, I mean, there is something in it for the patient. So although we would hope to increase our knowledge of these biochemical pathways. Um, understanding metabolism in head injured patients is particularly important um, because we know that metabolism becomes perturbed after a head injury. Um, so after a head injury, although we can make sure perfusion's okay, we can make sure the brain is getting enough oxygen, we can make sure the brain is getting enough glucose, um, we still see a failure of brain cells to um, efficiently metabolize um, that substrate um, such that they succumb to apop um, they succumb to cell death they undergo apoptosis um, and so understanding this will hopefully um, improve our management of these patients um, so our um, TBI protocol is on the right hand side of the screen um, and so as I've said with our TBI patients we the aim is to prevent secondary injury by ensuring adequate delivery of oxygen ensuring adequate delivery of um, substrate to the brain, maximizing perfusion. Um, so we do this by measuring the pressure, minimizing any rises in ICP, um, minimizing um, any swelling, and giving drugs, um, so anesthetic drugs, which reduce the metabolic demand of the brain, um, giving osmotic drugs to reduce swelling, 
and so on. And we have this um, stepwise protocol um, for mitigating the challenge to um, perfusion and metabolism that the brain faces after head injury. Um, and, you know, if things get really swollen, then we do a decompressive craniectomy. Um, and again, that's really just a way of trying to maximize perfusion um, and reduce the secondary um, injury that can occur um, after a head injury. Um, so one of the things that um, we've shown is that um, we can ameliorate some of the problems with energy um, metabolism um, by giving substrates such as succinate that can feed the TCA um, cycle um, directly. So although we can prevent, you know, we can make sure there's enough oxygen, we can make sure there's enough glucose, we know that the mitochondria still don't work as well. Uh, but by giving um, succinate directly, we've shown that we can improve that mitochondrial metabolism um, in the brain. And so we're now starting to um, integrate what we've learned through interrogating metabolism um, using the techniques um, that I've described, so the 13C microdialysis technique, um, into clinical protocols that will hopefully prove beneficial to the patient. Um, so this is just an example of a protocol um, that we're starting to use in our TBI patients. So um, there are obvious interventions that I'm sure you're all aware of for when the intracranial um, pressure is high. So if the ICP is more than 20, um, we would do things to minimize that, give hypotonic saline, give mannitol. Um, and then we try and decide um, when the... ICP is normal, um, but we still see that the brain tissue oxygen is low. Is that because there's not enough oxygen um, delivered to the brain or is that because of something else? Um, so we trial um, a little bit of hyperoxia. So increasing the oxygen settings on the ventilator to improve the brain tissue oxygen um, concentrations in the brain. Um, and then we also look at the glucose to prevent neuroglucose. Uh, neuroglycopenia. So we measure the brain glucose using the microdialysis catheters um, and we know that if the brain glucose is less than one millimole per litre um, then that's probably not enough for the brain cells. And so again we can do interventions to improve the um, brain glucose concentrations in the brain and measure them directly with the um, microdialysis. And then, as I've said, we look at the lactate pyruvate ratio, a marker of redox, a measure of the balance between anaerobic glycolytic metabolism and aerobic mitochondrial metabolism. Um, and we use a cutoff of 25 because um, large studies have shown that that relates to clinical outcomes. Um, and then we started to um, figure out some interventions that we can do when we're faced with a, a, high, a high LPR to mitigate um, that mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. So this is just really an example of how um, we've been able to um, use the knowledge that we've learned from the um, neurochemistry studies um, into trying to improve um, outcomes in patients, the tra translational aspects of the research. Um, so just to summarize really, um, the things that I've learned from my research, from my training, um, is that it pays to be persistent, it pays not to be phased by the grandiose, um, and so you really have to um, keep applying for grants, um, you know, keep trying to um, pursue projects and to see them through. Um, I really didn't get on with doing chemistry as an undergraduate, um, but you have to stay open-minded about these things, and so there's a slight irony that that's become the focus of my research. So. My second lesson is that to stay open-minded um, about these things. And really, my research has been, um, has been shaped by my clinical practice, um, and in particular, the availability of um, TBI patients and microdialysis. Um, and so it pays to be adaptive and to recognize the, um, the resources that you have available to do the research um, that you want to do. Uh, so that's my talk. If, um, if you guys have any questions like afterwards and you want to send me an email, um, then that's my email address is there. So um, feel, you know, feel free to do that. Um, and I'm just going to have a look at the chat to see if there's any questions. Um, so is preferential lactate metabolism exclusive to the nervous system? 
Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, there is some evidence that uh, even muscles, um, I know the, the adage is that, you know, when your muscles are getting tired after a run, um, that it's that buildup of lactate. Um, but actually there is some evidence that that lactate um, is used as, a, uh, as an energy substrate. Um, and so there are people studying that. Um, so Lorraine asked, what is the level of glucose which needs to be maintained to limit secondary brain injury? Um, so I think I answered that in the talk, but we use a, a, a cutoff of um, one millimole per liter. And I suppose nobody really knows the answer to that. And so it's based on um, large microdialysis studies looking at um, those patients that do well and those patients that do badly um, and uh, trying to use uh, statistics to um, you know, have a, a differential concentration for glucose that relates to those two types of outcomes and so most people would accept that one millimole of um of extracellular glucose is is what to aim for really but it's a balance because if you you don't want to make people too hyperglycemic because there are lots of studies that show um hyperglycemia in, in tbi patients is also poor for outcome um so most most um ITCUs that treat TBI patients will maintain normal, you know, a normal glucose concentration between seven and eleven millimoles per liter. Um, so the aim really is is to prevent uh, hypoglycemia. So hyperglycemia is, is bad. Um, somebody's asked, what advice would you give for an undergraduate who has an interest in traumatic brain injuries? Would you encourage them to pursue their interests early on? or stay open-minded. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I really, I don't know, I've, um, I suppose throughout my career, I've never had a huge kind of plan going forward. I mean, obviously I have had some kind of plan and I've been reasonably organized uh, in my kind of academic and clinical career path. Um, but I think, you know, starting out as a junior registrar, there, there were lots of different types of research projects that I could have done. I think the first, actually the first research research grant I applied for was um, was a diffusion tensile imaging, so an MRI study um, in tumor patients. Um, and so at the time I got really invested in that, but didn't get anywhere with funding as a change, uh, change tack. And I think you have to accept that you have to be a little bit flexible in terms of your academic interests, um, you know, for the reasons that I pointed out. Uh, cool. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. No, this yeah, is valuable. Um, just have a few questions that I received and mine as well. Um, so, the the catheter for uh, microdialysis is placed in the parenchyma. So, what 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 happens? How do you decide where to place it exactly, and how do you make the difference between local disturbances and general? General, generalized disturbances? Uh, so that's, I mean, that's a really good question because the, the nature of TBI is it's a really heterogeneous uh, disease. So you'll know that any um, TBI patient, they'll have areas of contusions, they'll have um, mass lesions, subdural extradurals, you know, one part of the brain may be more injured than the other part of the brain. Um, so, so you do have to be aware of that because all of these monitors, the brain tissue oxygen and the microanalysis catheters, um, just sample a small area of the brain. Um, so we would put the catheters in and get imaging afterwards to see where the catheter is um, and then interpret the results on the basis of, is it near a contusion? Um, you know, the results from if it's near a contusion are likely to be very different than if it's in a radiologically normal looking piece of brain, normal area of brain. Um, so generally, we aim to put the catheters in, in normal looking brain mm -hmm. uh, rather than in dead brain or contusions, mm -hmm. uh, just to be more representative of, um, you know, trying to prevent um, further brain loss from secondary injury. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the next question will be, are there any, is there any evidence that there's a difference in the neurochemistry of a brain that suffered um, traumatic brain injury, for example, versus a brain that suffered stroke? Um, yeah, I mean, stroke is, uh, I mean, obviously stroke starts off as a, a disease that really just affects one vascular territory. So it doesn't have the same geographical heterogeneity um, across the brain. So particularly with diffuse brain injury, mm -hmm. like the whole brain is affected, whereas with a stroke, it will just be 
the left MCA uh, region. Um, and so there, a lot of the secondary processes, um, so all the neurometabolic changes, the neuroinflammatory processes that happen after a, a traumatic brain injury, um, you don't see to the same extent um, after a stroke. Mm. Um, and then my final question will be, um, which are some of the leading theories explaining uh, mitochondrial dysfunction due to um, extracellular lactate accumulation? Um, so, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but the, um, uh, so there is, I mean, there's different ways to kind of understand that there is mitochondrial dysfunction after um, specifically TBI. And some of that is experimental data using, uh, you know, measuring more directly the function of mitochondria in, in rats, for example. Um, in patients, it's, um, I suppose, derived data, um, inferred kind of mitochondrial dysfunction from some of the metabolic data that we see, uh, for example. Um, there were some imaging studies, um, so you can use, uh, you know, phosphorus spectroscopy um, to, to kind of review uh, high energy phosphates, and that can give some indication that there's mitochondrial um, dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I suppose one of the consequences of mitochondrial dysfunction might be lactate accumulation, um, but we don't really know. So that lactate accumulation um, could be because of um, you know, preferential neuronal rather than astrocytic cell loss after head injury. Um, it could be an adaptive response, um, you know, a lactate accumulating as an adaptive response, um, trying to improve the energy deficit that results from mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and so we, we just don't really understand enough about that. And that's one of the, the interesting things about, you know, lactate always being um, perceived as a, as a waste energy uh, substrate is that um, it's, it's not, it's probably not as simple as that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the questions, but it's apart yeah. from saying that it's a complicated issue. Um, so there's a question from Dr. Gangpei about the time window for placing a microdialysis catheter. Uh, so we, I mean, we put them in at the same time we put the ICP monitor. And um, so usually that decision is made relatively early after they come to us. Mm -hmm. uh, so a patient will get admitted. Um, they'll be admitted on the intensive care unit and usually within an hour or two they'll have an ICP monitor, a brain tissue oxygen catheter, um, and a microdialysis catheter inserted. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. If anyone has... Oh, okay, thanks. If anyone has a question, please feel free to um, ask in the chat section or raise your hand. Um, well, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and ask another one. Um, is for so for traumatic brain injuries, we've noticed that there's a, a difference in the epidemiology and presentation of cases in high-income countries versus low- and middle-income countries. Where in low- and middle-income countries, we have younger patients usually who find themselves um, get will get care, definitive care, quite late. And I was wondering, um, would how I mean, with what you found about the, um, uh, the role of lactate succinate and all these um, um, energy substrates in brain metabolism, do you envision that um, there'll be less indications for surgery in uh, traumatic brain injury um, and less indication for like high volume centers taking care of these patients um, than it is the case today? such a way that we will need them to travel all the way to the big cities to get the care they need. No, I mean, as, as it's, it's difficult, as kind of heterogeneous as TBI is, I mean, it's really like all the cascades of different pathophysiological processes that happen in the brain after head injury uh, are vast and complex. And so all the interventions that we do, we do all these little different things, you know, you put the head up, uh, of the bed up, you give some mannitol, you give some hypotonic saline, you hyperventilate them a little bit, you, you reduce their temperature, you give some anti-seizure medications. Um, it, there's almost hundreds of different interventions that these patients uh, will receive. I mean, there's no evidence that just changing one thing is going to make such an impact that it will reduce the need for 
decompressive craniectomy or anything like that. Um, I suppose the, the other the other way to answer that question is to say that it's quite difficult to uh, to study the impact of individual interventions on outcome. It's quite difficult to study whether it makes a difference just because it's such a complex system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really, you know, you just have to um, study it uh, as a whole. Um, I mean, it's a bit like, you know, studying individual interventions trying to reduce the rate of shunt infection. Um, it's very difficult to show that, you know, um, changing your gloves during a shunt procedure makes a difference to infection rates. But when you look at a whole package of interventions, then you can start to see a difference. Um, and it's probably similar with TBI. Um, and actually, I think that's one of the reasons why monitors are really useful, because we can't really be guided by clinical outcomes. We have to have surrogate measures of, of tissue death to know that our interventions are, are doing any good or worthwhile. Um, I think I kind of half answered your question. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. We have a few questions that came in. Um, so from Gideon, um, are there any fundamentals that are known to increase traumatic brain injury morbidity? I don't know if Gideon means comorbidities that have been identified in TBI outcomes. I mean, the, the thing with TBI is that all the, the kind of the crash data, which was the big cohort of um, thousands of patients that were given steroids as a clinical trial, um, and some of the other big um, epidemiological cohorts of TBI patients uh, show that overwhelmingly the things that make a difference are how old you are, um, your GCS and presentation. Um, and so your GCS on presentation and the age of the patient account for probably 80%, if not more, of your outcome from a TBI. So, you know, if you present with GCS3 and you're 80, you're going to die. Um, if you present GCS9 and you're 20, you're probably going to survive. Um, and so everything else, all this, you know, um, um, you know, partly it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, all the other things uh, do have an impact, but it's it will be much smaller than those mm. those big um, you know, those big factors. Thank you, um, Dr. Safari. His question is about the use of uh, manitol versus hypertonic solutions, especially in the pediatric population. Um, so the um, are there any scores or clin- clinical guidelines? Um, I guess his question is about the evidence behind. Yeah, I mean, so the, the latest. Um, uh, brain trauma foundation guidelines for children uh, recommend hypertonic saline um, so either as a bolus of three uh, percent hypertonic saline or there is some evidence now for giving hypertonic saline infusions um, and I think just particularly with children there's more evidence for hypertonic saline than there is for mannitol mm-hmm. um, but mannitol is still used uh, in children um, as you know, the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, much of the evidence is kind of level three uh, evidence. So it's not, it's not randomized trials. Um, but, but yeah, there are, I can't remember exactly, but um, hypertonic saline is one of the things that um, either bolus or infusion is, is recommended and has been shown to lower ICP um, in pediatric uh, trauma patients specifically. Um, so there's more evidence in children for hypertonic saline over mannitol, but mannitol still lowers ICP. Okay, thank you. And I guess that, um, this will be our last year. Um, Dr. Kennedy Kimani, I'm asking about um, the interaction between alcohol intoxication and traumatic brain injury. Do, do, you, do you have any evidence about how alcohol intoxication affects brain chemistry? Uh, no, I, don't, I mean, I don't think there's any um, studies out there that have looked at that specifically. I mean, I think interestingly, the I think alcohol is is meant to be uh, protective uh, for head injured patients. I think if you, um, I mean, it's, again, it's difficult to tease out. I suppose if you are an alcoholic, you're probably more likely to have a head injury. So there's probably a broader range of patients. Mm-hmm. Um, but some of the clinical studies show that uh, you know being intoxicated can actually be protective in terms of your outcomes from TBI. Uh, but in terms of how it affects um, brain chemistry uh, specifically, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I can't imagine that it would have an effect at the cellular level, mm-hmm. um, you know, that makes a, a difference in terms of neuronal loss. Oh, um, thank you so much. As you can see, it was uh, very interesting and everyone is uh, 
everyone's coming up with questions at the time. This yeah. was really fantastic. Um, it's very different from what we are used to doing in terms of research. Uh -huh. And I hope that this will um, ignite some passions here for people to go into biochemistry and the chemistry of the brain. <laughs> yeah. So do we, if you guys have any questions or, you know, um, want to pursue anything, just send me an email. I'm always happy to, uh, to respond. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, I'll stop the recording now.